The silence of an African jungle on a dark night needs to be experienced to be realized. It is most impressive, especially when one is absolutely alone and isolated from one's fellow creatures as I was then. John Henry Patterson, The Man-Eaters of Savo We live in an age of relative safety, at least compared to the way our ancestors lived in their caves during prehistoric times. In those days, people lived in constant fear and foreboding, huddling around fires or inside the safety of their caverns at night, knowing that there were things out there that could easily make short work of any man. Nowadays, with modern technology at our beck and call, things are simple, safe, and, for the most part at least, easy. Most animals have come to fear human settlements, and rightly so. Sometimes though you get exceptions. You might get one bear or even one shark that isn't just afraid of people. It actively seeks them out. This time, we're going to discuss one of said exceptions in nature and delve into the dreaded man-eaters of Tsavo, a pair of murderous lions otherwise remembered by fearful workers as the ghost and the darkness. Hi, hello, and welcome again everybody to another episode of Natural Juan. This time around, we're going to get a look at one of the most protracted wildlife conflicts, the attack of the Tsavo man-eaters, which became such a huge headache to the British Empire during the latter part of the 1800s. However, before all that, I'd like to invite you all to subscribe to my channel and hit that bell for notifications for more content like this. Special shout out too to Mr. Jonathan Green, my patron in Patreon. If you would also like to support my channel and what I do here, please feel free to check out my Patreon information in the description below, which also comes with both PayPal and Gcash info for making one-time donations. This video is also dedicated to Miss Jade Menor, my colleague and compatriot who seems to be quite the expert on cat behavior. All right, with all that out of the way, it's time to step onto the grassy plains of Africa and walk with the ghost and the darkness. To fully understand the events that took place during the year that Savo man-eaters terrorized the workers of the Kenya-Ugandan Railway, we must first understand the context of the time. During March to December of 1898, the London-based Ugandan Railway Committee began efforts to link much of Africa together through trade routes involving bridges and trains. One of their most ambitious projects yet would be the railroad that would be built over the Tsavo River, linking both Kenya and Uganda in trade and bringing what was then thought to be an uncivilized continent into an age of civility and industrialism. To this end, the Ugandan Railway Committee, whose headquarters were located in London, deigned to commission then-Lieutenant Colonel John Henry Patterson of the British Army as an overseer for their project. His sole purpose there would be to see to it that the bridge and railway would be built without too much trouble, and make sure that the United Kingdom wasn't wasting its resources on pointless endeavors. Unfortunately, the lieutenant colonel would get more than he bargained for, as he would soon discover, much to his frustration and horror. All things considered, John Henry Patterson could just as easily be a hero in his own right considering his many exploits. Heck, his personal account of what went on in Savo is the primary basis for not just one but three films about the Savo man-eaters, with the third and most recent, The Ghost and the Darkness, being quite well made and featuring the acting talents of Val Kilmer as Patterson himself and Michael Douglas. Indeed, much of this discussion will be based primarily on Patterson's account entitled The Man-Eaters of Savo, published 1907, along with a few records from various sources at the time. The trouble with the lions began almost the same moment as Patterson himself arrived in Africa. He arrived on the island of Mombasa a few months prior to the start of the project and became more familiar with the area he would be overseeing later. On his way to the Savo River, which was situated between Kenya and Uganda, he noted how the landscape became somewhat drearier with the dirt becoming more blood red and the vegetation becoming sparser. He even noted in his journals how ostriches seemed to run alongside the train as if to gaze upon the foolhardy humans who thought they could rule over nature. 
Anyway, upon Patterson's arrival to the construction site, there were already more than 8,000 workers from various cultures, both local and foreign, who were on the scene. This pleased him a great deal as this meant that the project was already underway and that all he really had to do was to see to it that everything was running on time and that, that there was no one in any real danger or trouble. Some of the first acquaintances the lieutenant colonel had made was that of a Jemhadar or Sikh warrior named Singh, whose duty it was to maintain order and productivity among the workers. Needless to say, John Henry came to respect Singh, especially since their duties were similar, which made his untimely death later more shocking and disturbing. When the first news of possible lion attacks reached Patterson's ears, he first believed it to be the work of other workers who were either greedy or jealous of their fellow workers. They were after all being paid handsomely for their hard work, and the lieutenant colonel would be surprised if there were those who wanted more and were willing to take it from their fellows. It was only when his acquaintance, Singh, was taken that the British officer began to take the threat of attack more seriously, as he knew of very few who would dare tangle with the Sikh warrior. Through Singh's own acquaintances, Patterson learned of how the Jemhadar was taken by the devils one night and was found the next day, torn limb from limb by from what appeared to be a pair of lions. Thus began the many long months of Patterson trying to hunt the elusive pair of lions who preyed upon the workers of the camp on an almost nightly basis. From a more mundane perspective, the lions were simply a pair of species of maneless lions, though they were both male. They were likely brothers since they were extremely familiar with one another and could cooperate and coordinate at an astounding degree. It was their ability to work together and to seemingly always stay two steps ahead of the lieutenant colonel and the other people at the camp that got people wondering whether or not the beasts were somehow supernatural in nature. This was what led to the two lions being named the ghost and the darkness by the workers since they often moved invisible among the tall grass and always attacked in places and ways that beggared explanation. Indeed, while John Henry Patterson did his best to keep the lions out using thick and dangerous thorn bushes, the lions almost always found a way in and managed to drag off at least one victim from the 8,000 workers each night. On an almost nightly basis, the lieutenant colonel would stand ready atop one of his shooting scaffoldings with a newfound friend among the workers, prepared to shoot one of the two lions, but almost always, the lions would find a way to elude him. One of the most frustrating and perhaps disturbing moments Patterson had with the lions was when he and one of the medical officers, a man named Dr. Brock, decided to lay a trap for the two beasts while safely nestled within a pair of wagons put together, a mechanism the lieutenant colonel likened to being in a coffin with a medical officer while goats were tied up close by to serve as bait for the pair of lions. Neither Patterson nor Brock managed to hit one of the lions even though they did manage to fire at the beasts with their rifles. Once out of their armored coffin-like mechanism, the two men were deafened by the discharge of their weapons and the lions not only managed to get away scot-free but also claimed one of the goats as their prize. After that debacle, the lions kept out of trouble for at least two months and the workers thought that either Patterson or Brock had managed to land a hit on one of the creatures. Patterson knew better however as he failed to hear the sound of a bullet impacting flesh and there was a general lack of blood in the area where he and Dr. Brock made their trap. While there were no attacks from April until June of that year, the workers would once again tremble and whisper furtively to one another, Beware brothers, the devils are coming, or be alert, the ghosts are here. And indeed, by July, the lions returned, and Patterson began to see them as not just a danger to his workers and their progress, but as a danger to himself as well. Upon their return, the lions took for themselves a victim, and, as if to mock the workers, devoured the poor man within earshot of his fellows, but obscured in darkness and tall grass so as to be almost invisible. It was this psychological torture, or is it? that made many wonder whether or not the ghost and the darkness really were just a pair of lions or were they something more. 
Out of desperation, the lieutenant colonel wrote to Mombasa to ask for any kind of help. This was answered by a Mr. Whitehead, a district officer who arrived around December 3 of 1898 with a group of African warrior hunters who specialized in hunting lions. He fancied himself as a great hunter of sorts, but upon his arrival was already beset by the lions who behaved as if they knew who and what he was and what he meant for them. Upon meeting Patterson on the afternoon of December 3, Mr. Whitehead revealed to the former the claw marks of lions which ended just below his armpit. Then, as if that wasn't enough, Mr. Whitehead was again attacked by lions with only his rifle standing between him and certain death. The district officer was able to fire his weapon and scare off the lion, but not before one of them decided to abscond with his faithful assistant, whom the two brutes set about killing and eating in the tall grass. Finally, inspired by the suggestion of some Indian workers on how to trap tigers, Patterson put together a trap that he hoped would be able to put an end to his lion problem. He constructed a sturdy cage with two sections that would be able to close on its own similar to the mechanisms of a guillotine. He would place armed men at one section while bait and a trap door would be prepared at the other. He first tried this trap with himself but it seemed that the lions were aware of him so he decided on another approach altogether. He once again mounted one of his shooting scaffoldings at one end of the camp while placing trained police officers in the trap he prepared. He did this because of the lion's knack for knowing where he was and avoiding him. Patterson also made sure to brief the police officers he had set within the trap and demonstrate to them that there was no way the lion would be able to enter their section of the trap. The lieutenant colonel felt so confident at this development that, upon hearing the guillotine-like trapdoor shutting, thought that at least half of his lion problem had already been solved. Oh well, the best laid plans and all that. It seemed that the officers Patterson had put in the trap had issues of their own and weren't able to land a single solid hit on the lion they were supposedly had trapped. As a matter of fact, some of the bullets were flying this way and that telling both Patterson and Whitehead that the rifle-armed officers in the trap had no clear idea what they were doing. Almost miraculously, a stray bullet struck one of the ropes in the guillotine-like mechanism, freeing the lion and making sure that the lieutenant colonel's problems continued. The next morning, both Patterson and Whitehead tried tracking and hunting the lions. This became almost a routine for both the lieutenant colonel and the district officer, with the latter bringing with him the native hunters who he thought improved their chances of finally killing the lions. Again, John Henry Patterson's plans would be laid to nines when his very own weapon would fail him just when he had already come face to face with one of the lions. One night though, he would get lucky while sitting atop a tree surveying the outside of the camp. He shot the lion repeatedly when they surprised one another while he sat atop the tree. That night, people celebrated even though only one of the lions was confirmed to have been shot. Workers and guards from all cultures cheered and danced since half of their lion problem had already been solved. Only Patterson chose not to celebrate as he knew that they weren't quite out of the woods yet when it came to the lions. They tracked and found the corpse of the lion the next day with Mr. Whitehead and his hunters. At first, Patterson was even afraid that the lion was only pretending to have been subdued and that it had set a trap for him and his companions. Luckily, that was not the case and the lieutenant colonel was able to retrieve the lion and bring it back to camp. His most pressing concern at the time was keeping the workers from tearing apart the lion corpse for souvenirs. For the next 10 days, there was no lion activity, and many of the workers prayed, thought, or hoped that the remaining lion had run off after his compatriot had been killed. Unfortunately, that wouldn't be the case, and after those first 10 days of peace, the remaining lion returned to terrorize the workers. Sleep deprived, John Henry Patterson continued his vigil against the remaining lion, constantly on watch in one of his scaffoldings at night and then tracking the brute by day. One night, while on watch, he was awakened by his young companion who signaled to him that the lion was approaching their scaffolding. Patterson didn't immediately startle awake. 
and chose to carefully rise and watch the arrival of the remaining lion. Thanks to the fact that the moon was bright in the sky, he was able to see and track the lion as it moved quietly across the fields. He also learned by then that the lion was not interested in the goat they prepared as bait and that it was either interested in him or his young friend. According to Patterson's account even, it was likely the lion had come to avenge his dead comrade, if such an animal was even capable of such a sentiment. And then, at the penultimate moment, Patterson opened fire on the lion, and the latter ran off into the tall grass, roaring, whimpering, and hissing, displaying all the traits of an animal that had been mortally wounded. The next day, Patterson and his companions tracked down the last lion, who did not seem quite dead at the time. It seemed that while it had already sustained wounds both grievous and fatal, it clearly had a lot of fight left in it and managed to endure several more confirmed hits from the lieutenant colonel's rifle. Even while on the verge of death, the lion managed to chase the British officer up a tree and continued to fight even though it should have been dead by all rights by that point. It was only when Patterson managed to hit the lion point blank that it finally went down for good and the bridge and railway was completed without much incident. The remains of the lions can be seen today in a museum in Chicago, Illinois in the United States. Unfortunately, due to both damage the creature sustained and Patterson securing his own portions of the beasts as a kind of trophy, the two appear smaller than they did in real life. Again, both are maneless and male and continue to baffle experts about how they were able to acquire so many victims, avoid detection, and behave as if they somehow personally knew the people who hunted them. Most agree that the lion simply hunted humans as a result of a tooth infection that prevented them from hunting their preferred prey such as antelope, zebras, and other beasts that were present in the area. This is more common than most people think, as many a man-eating tiger or wolf has been discovered to be suffering from one handicap or another that made it difficult to hunt their usual prey. That said, it has been expounded time and again that these lions did not simply kill humans for food. As evidence proves, the lions killed for pleasure, often eschewing the remains of their victims after they had thoroughly dismembered them. If you really want to know what I think, I'd say that the most rational explanation for the lions' behavior was that they were probably trained by someone as attack animals of sorts. Perhaps they then killed their trainer or the latter simply died of natural causes, leaving them to fend for themselves. This is, from what I surmise, probably the main reason the lions displayed such intimate knowledge of human behavior and was what allowed them to hunt the workers of the railway with such ruthless efficiency. However, again, much like all my other opinions, this is just my two cents on the topic, and even I am willing to accept an alternate theory should one present itself. Anyway, that's it for this episode of Natural Juan. I really hope you enjoyed this video, and if you did, please subscribe to my channel and hit that bell for notifications. If you would also like to support my channel and what I do here, you'll find my Patreon information in the description below, along with PayPal and Gcash info for quick one-time donations. Natural Juan, 